Welcome to the Supernatural Life Podcast with Chad Gonzalez, a podcast all about helping you connect with God so you can manifest God to the world. Now, here's your host, Chad Gonzalez. Hey friends, this is Chad Gonzalez. I want to welcome you to this episode of the Supernatural Life Podcast. It's our goal to help you connect with God so you can manifest God to your world. So excited to be with you this month of May. We had a tremendous month in the month of April, and we were in Indiana, Oklahoma, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, and just had some tremendous meetings there. So they had a first in the area of healing in which there was a man in Oklahoma that was healed of multiple sclerosis. That's the first one that we've seen, at least as far as you know, I personally have seen experienced in, in some of my services and conferences, and it was just awesome. And the great thing is we have a video testimony from this man sharing and showing what had happened, what he had been dealing with for like the last 20, 30 years, and then what happened instantly in the service. We have that right there on our YouTube channel. If you haven't been to our YouTube channel recently, go there, check out the healing testimonies. There's a playlist there for healing testimonies. Go look at that. I'm telling you, it'll inspire your faith to see the things that God has been doing in people's lives. I've really pushed to, for me, not to just share the stories, but to have the opportunity for you to hear it from those people, see it from them. And it's just awesome to be able to hear those things from those people. But we had a guy healed of MS in that same service in Oklahoma. There was a woman that was deaf in both ears. She was healed. We saw short limbs grow out in these meetings. We've had cancers healed. We have had knots and growth dissolve. We've just been seeing all kinds of wonderful, wonderful things in the first several months of this year. So, so very excited and privileged to be a part of what God is doing. Hey, at the end of May, we're going to be in Nairobi, Kenya. Very excited about this. Our first international trip for 2022. And it's going to be at the East Africa Faith Conference. I know there's a lot of you in Kenya that actually listen to the Supernatural Life podcast and watch our weekly healing talks. And so, if you can be in Nairobi at the end of the month, I'm telling you, it's going to be awesome. This conference is one of the highlights of my year. I love going to speak at this. Just wonderful people and wonderful meetings. If you're in the U.S., we're going to be in Sulphur Springs, Texas, Durham, North Carolina, and Holland, Michigan in the month of June. And so great meetings coming up there in June and other things coming up in the summer. We'll be back in Florida. We'll be in California. Just some wonderful stuff coming up. Hey, I want to say this. Those of you that are partners with Chad Gonzalez Ministries, thank you so very much for all that you do. Thank you for being a sender. You know, one of our projects is called Project Go. And so what we do with the funds there is we cover all of our travel expenses to the meetings that I go and speak at. It was just something that I had on my heart that I wanted to do. And so we've been doing this. We don't charge churches anything. I never believed in that. You know, Lacey and I, we pastored for 15 years, so I was on that side of it. And, you know, I understand sometimes some of the pressures that come with that when you have people coming in. And, and so I just wanted to do things a little bit different. And so I, I just set that as a goal that we would just believe God for the extra finances to cover our, our travel there, cover our hotel, stuff like that. And so that's the way that we've been operating. And I'm telling you, it's been just such a blessing to be able to do that. And it's actually been very surprising the comments and responses we've gotten from the pastors and churches when they find out that we're actually doing that. But it's just been awesome. And one of the reasons we've been able to do that is because of our partners. We have a project called Project Go. And so all the funds that come from that, we use the funds in that to cover all of our travel expenses. And so not only can we sow spiritually into these churches, but it's also one way that we can sow financially as well. So thank you to all of our partners who support the ministry financially every month. And also thank you for for all of you that's been coming to the meetings. It's just been very overwhelming to me, humbling that so many of you have spent the time and the finances to come to these meetings literally all over the country. And it's just so humbling when you guys show up and, and come and introduce yourself and, and you say, hey, Chad, I just want to let you know I'm a partner with you. It just blesses me so very much. And so I just want to say thank you to all of you that are partners with us. Thank you for your, your support, your encouragement. And thank you for for who you are and being a part of the team. Couldn't do it without you. All right, so let's get into the message for this month. And it's simply this. 
calling all of the Elijahs. The other day, I had a dream. I'll tell you about that dream in a moment. But I had a dream and I woke up and the Lord reminded me about Elijah and Mount Carmel. It's 1 Kings chapter 18 and in verse 20. And it says, Ahab summoned all the people of Israel and the prophets to Mount Carmel. And Elijah stood in front of them and said, How much longer will you waver, hobbling between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. And everyone was completely silent. And Elijah said, I'm the only prophet of the Lord who's left, but Baal has 450 prophets. Now bring two bulls, and the prophets of Baal can choose whichever one they wish and cut it into pieces and lay it on the wood of their altar, but without setting fire to it. And I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood of the altar, but not set fire to it. And then call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by setting fire to the wood is the true God. And all the people agreed. Well, if you read the rest of the story, you find out that the prophets of Baal, they spent literally all day calling on their supposed gods for something to happen, and nothing happened. It got to the point where Elijah began to mock them. He began to make fun of them throughout the day. And so nothing happened for the prophets of Baal. Elijah finally calls all the people to come over to him. He rebuilds the altar to the Lord. He digs a trench around the altar, and they pour about three gallons of water on that, on the bull, on the wood, all around the altar. And then at the end of it, in verse 36 and 37, Elijah says this, He says, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, prove today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. Prove that I have done all this at your command. Lord, answer me. Answer me so these people will know that you, Lord, are God and that you've brought them back to yourself. And immediately the fire of the Lord flashed down from heaven and burned up the young bull, the wood, the stones, and the dust. It even licked up all the water in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell down on the ground and cried out, The Lord, he is God. Yes, the Lord, he is God. It came down to proving time. And, you know, we're in a situation today where you look around at what's going on in the world. I mean, I'm just amazed at how quickly things have changed in our culture and society over the last 10 to 15 years. But even in the last just two to three years, seeing in what's been going on in our world, where we're literally at a point where there's, there's a reversal taking place of good and evil, where Good used to be good, now it's bad, and what was bad is now good. We're seeing these things taking place. And for the last 20, 30, 40 years, there's been lots of tremendous teaching in the church. We have seen the church over the last uh, 20 years become very inventive and creative in the things that they're doing to reach people, and those things are, are needed and it's good. We've seen those big pushes, but there really hasn't been much of a supernatural church. And I truly believe we're coming into a time that it's going to require proving, not just preaching, but it's going to require proving, It's going to require proving. And you see this happen with Elijah. It came down to a proving time. And then what happened was with Elijah, after he proves it, then Ahab goes back and tells Jezebel what happened. Jezebel gets ticked off. She sends a messenger to Elijah and says, hey, By this time tomorrow, you're going to be dead. She was ticked off. And I truly believe that in these coming days, there's going to be some Mount Carmels and and some Jezebels that are about to start calling the Elijahs. And so the question is, where are the Elijahs? You know, a lot of people are asking, where's God? Now, the real question is, where are the Elijahs? Where are those people who are willing to put their pride and their reputation on the line? Where are the Elijahs who are willing to say, hey, I'm not just okay with preaching. I'm not just okay with teaching. We have to demonstrate this. We have to prove this. Where are those guys? Where are those gals? And then if that's you, then I just want to encourage you. You need to get ready. You need to get ready. There, there's all these people today that love all their titles. But you know what? The titles don't mean much if there's no fruit there. And I'm telling you, we're coming into a time where there's going to have to be some proving. And yet, you see this all throughout Scripture in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. God has always been in the business of doing some proving for carnal people. 
He's always been in the business of proving, using physical proofs for supernatural truths for carnal people. And I truly believe that we're going to start seeing these types of things again. It may not be, you know, building an altar and calling fire down out of heaven, but I'm telling you, signs, wonders, and miracles have been the normal, it's been the normal operating procedure for God under the old covenant and under the new covenant. It is coming a time that the church is not going to be able to simply rely on their five-point sermons, fog machines, light shows, and all of their creative abilities. We're also going to have to demonstrate our supernatural abilities. Now, let me tell you about this dream that I had the other day, which led to this piece about Elijah and Mount Carmel. The other day, I went to sleep, and I had this dream, and in this dream... I was at a Bible school, and I was in a room. I was sitting down with a group of students, and I was doing some teaching. Well, this one student comes in through the back door, obviously very upset, came in, and almost at the point of yelling at me and telling me how wrong I am, was just really, really mad and angry about some things, told me I was wrong, and then turned around and stormed out the door. Well, it ticked me off in the dream. It ticked me off. And so I get up. And I walk out the door and I follow this, this guy, I find him and I stop him. And I start talking to him. I mean, I'm mad. I start talking to him. Well, this other student comes in and gets in between me and him and puts his hands on his shoulders and starts consoling the guy. Starts consoling him, starts trying to talk to him, showing him some sympathy. And when I was standing there, the Lord told me this. In the dream, the Lord told me this. As I stand before the student that's mad, the Lord said this. There are some times that people don't need sympathy. Instead, they need a move of God. So I push the the guy that's given the sympathy. I push him out of the way and tell him to stop it. And I put my hands on the shoulders of the student that's angry. And when I did, I released the power of God into his body. This guy falls down to the ground, and then he just starts busting out laughing. I mean, the joy of the Lord comes all over this guy. And it went from him, and it spread through the students that were all gathered around watching this in the hallway. And all of a sudden, all of us are just overcome with the joy of the Lord. And I woke up. And that's when this thought came to me about Elijah and Mount Carmel. And the Lord told me this, that the Elijahs that are out there need to get ready because the Mount Carmels and the Jezebels are going to be calling. Friends, I'm telling you, there's a proving time. Right now, we're seeing this quick moving reversal of good and evil. And I'm telling you, simply debating and lecturing is not going to get the job done all the time. There's a reason that Jesus actually believed that signs would be needed to prove the message. We find the Apostle Paul in talking to King Agrippa in Acts chapter 26. And and after talking to King Agrippa, he makes this statement and says, Paul, you've almost persuaded me to become a Christian. In other words, he was almost persuaded but not convinced enough to become a Christian. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 4, Paul tells the Corinthians, he says, I did not come to you with words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the power of God. Friends, I'm telling you, there is coming a time very, very soon in which you and I, we will stand before people of importance. We will stand before leaders, political leaders, governmental leaders, people of influence, people of importance, people that will need approving, that it will be people that a debate will not just change things. It will be kings, dictators, governmental leaders that will not be influenced just by policy and just by debate, not by lecture. No, it's going to have to come through proving. Paul understood this, that the demonstration of the power of God had to be in effect. Why is that? Because Jesus believed that. Jesus said in John chapter 10 and verse 38, he said, do not believe me if I do not do the works of my father. And if you don't believe me, believe the works. If you don't believe what I'm saying, Believe the works that you would know that the Father is in me and I am in him. Notice that Jesus, 
He put his pride, reputation, put the ministry on the line and said, if you don't believe the message that I preach, believe the works, believe the miracles that I do, because these miracles prove my union with the Father. This is what Jesus was letting us know in his prayer in the upper room in John chapter 17, verses 20 through 23. Jesus said, Father, I pray for all those who will believe in me through the word, the word that's preached. Father, I pray for them that they would be one just as we are one. The world would know that you sent me and the glory that you gave me, I've given it unto them that they would be one as we are one. Jesus' prayer was union for us to be united with the Father. And if Jesus believed that the miracles would prove his union with the Father, friends, I'm telling you, we're in the very same boat. We're in the very same position. We have the same authority. We have the same commission to go into this world, preach this gospel with signs and wonders and miracles following the word that's preached. God's method of operation has always been physical proofs for a spiritual truth. You see this in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. We see it with Elijah there on Mount Carmel. We see it with Moses and Pharaoh. He gave Moses not only the words to speak, but also the power to back it up. Moses went in there to talk to Pharaoh, but then when that didn't work, what happened? Demonstrated the power of God, released the power of God. Why to prove these things? We even see it in Revelation during the tribulation that God's going to send these two witnesses whom some people actually believe it's Moses and Elijah going to come back. And they're not only going to be preaching and prophesying, they're also going to be demonstrating with power. Friends, I'm telling you, we are right there, right at the cusp of this thing is going to require us to begin to demonstrate the power of God. I mean, I'm looking at what's going on, not just in the world. I'm looking at where we are as a church, the church of Jesus right now. I know there's a lot of international people, people outside the U.S. that listen to this, but I can tell you right now here in America, you look at what's going on in the church, it's extremely lethargic, extremely anemic. There's, there's no supernatural for the most part. Some of the churches I've gone to, I mean, it's, it gives me a glimmer of hope and finding some places that are truly pushing, pushing for the power of God, not just preaching things, but willing to put things on the line. Friends, I'm telling you right now, where I've seen the greatest miracles in my life and ministry was literally those times when I just laid it all out there. I was willing to look like a fool, just walked off the plank, basically, and it was just me and God. And that's where I've seen the greatest, greatest miracles. We're coming into a time there's going to have to be some proving. There's going to have to be some demonstrating. Because there's people, and remember, the sinners are sinners for a reason. They're sin. They're carnal. They are, they're not one with God. Their spiritual eyes have not been opened. They're going to need some physical proofs. I know even for me, I was in that situation. I was 19 years old. I was away from home. I was going to college in Dallas, Texas. And I was just at a place in my life when I was really questioning the reality of God. I'd grown up in church. I knew what my pastor believed. I knew what my parents believed. But God just wasn't real to me. And some of you, you've heard my story, and so I, I won't repeat it for the sake of time today. But I ran from God for nine months, and it took me having this supernatural encounter with God when I found out He was very real. And that's what radically changed my life. And it set me on the path that I'm on today. Well, Last year, I was in Canton, Georgia, and I was telling the story about what happened for me. And at the end of that service, there was a young girl who came up to me. She was 20 years old, and she was in a place, just kind of a dark place, and just questioning things and searching for the, for the reality of God for herself. And, and so, anyway, we led her in a salvation prayer. And then when I got done, she looked at me and she said, I want an experience like you had when you were 20. I said, what do you mean? She said, you know, when you told the story about when you were in Texas and going to school and you're questioning the reality of God and that experience happened for you. She said, I want that too. Well, I'm not going to lie. I didn't show it on the outside, but on the inside, I questioned, well, can I do that? But I didn't show it. And so I just stepped out. I put my hands on her shoulder 
And I said, Father, I ask you right now, Father, what you gave me in that moment when I was 20, I ask you to give that to her right now. And in that moment, all of a sudden, she began to shake. Now, this was not a girl, doesn't seem like she really grew up in church. She wasn't the churchy type of person. You could tell she didn't really know much about the things of God at all. All of a sudden, she just begins to shake. Now, I didn't feel anything. But I'm looking at her. I know she's not making this up. She starts shaking all over the place. This goes on for about 30 seconds. She opens up her eyes and she said, whoa. And I said, what happened? She said, it felt like, like there was fire going through my body, like my bones were about to rattle out of my skin. She looked at her mom and she said, I've never experienced anything like that before. And it was an eye opener for her. It was an eye opener for me. But I realized in that moment, hey, some people are going to need an encounter with God. And you know what? God is okay with that. He had no problem obliging to that girl that she wanted an experience with God. She wanted an experience with God. And it opened her eyes to that. That's what happened for me. It opened my eyes and helped me. I needed something supernatural because I'd heard a lot of preaching for 20 years. And it, it had kept me in a, in a place of still kind of being safe to a degree and, and searching. And I didn't veer too, too far from it. But I needed some proving. And friend, I'm telling you, God has always been proving in the Old Testament. He was proving in the New Testament, the Bible. He's proving in the New Testament even still today. But how is he going to prove? It's always come through a man or a woman. It's always come through a person. And you and I, God saved you and I for last. He saved us for this end time move of God. He saved you. Have you ever thought about that? He could have picked anybody. He could have saved John Lake for the last days. He could have saved Smith Wigglesworth for the last days. He could have saved Elijah for the last days. But he didn't. He saved you. He saved you. He actually trusted you with the message, with the anointing, to prove, to prove the reality of the gospel of Jesus Christ in these last days. You are one of the Elijahs. And you need to prepare yourself and get ready. Because, friend, I'm telling you, Mount Carmel and Jezebel, they're calling. So let me give you this before we go. There's five things that we must see so that we can do. There's five things that we, we must change about our perspective so that we can do, so that we can prove the miraculous in these very last days. Number one, we must see ourselves as sent ones. Jesus said in John chapter 17, he said, Father, as you sent me, I send them into the world. He said, they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. You have to see yourself as a sent one. In the book of John, 41 times Jesus refers to himself as being sent from heaven. If that was important to Jesus and his perspective, it needs to be important to you and I and our perspective. We must see ourselves as sent ones. We must see ourselves as sent from another world, a superior world, into this world to prove and manifest the power of God. Number two, we must see ourselves as masters over the curse. We must see ourselves as masters, as righteous, because if you don't, you'll be standing before things that seem like they're bigger than you. And if it looks like it's bigger than you, then you're going to have a hard time releasing your faith. No, you need to see yourself not only as a sent one, but a master over the things that you see. Number three, we must see that all things are possible. We've got to wipe away all the impossibilities that we have in our thoughts and in our imaginations. We must understand that all things are possible with God and all things are possible with us. Jesus, because of salvation, he put us in the God class of things, that nothing is impossible with God and all things are possible for him who believes. All things are possible. I didn't know when I was standing in front of that girl if it was possible for a moment. Didn't know if it was possible that God could give her the same experience he had given me 25 years before. But you know what? He sure did. He did it. Why? Because he loves people. And I had to get a hold of my thoughts really quickly and realize, hey, this is possible. If he did it for me, he'll do it for her. Number four, we must see ourselves as spirit beings. This is a big one. This is something that the Lord led me back into at the end of the summer to go back 
and start restudying spirit, soul, and body. And I'm telling you, it has totally, radically changed some things for me over the last eight months. And it's actually helped me in getting better results in the area of healing. But we have to see ourselves as a spirit being. The reason is this. We've grown up in this, this physical world. We've grown up in this carnal world. And the reason a lot of us are not getting the results that we know we should, because we're just too carnal, and we see ourselves as a body. We see ourselves as just a mere human being. But friend, I'm telling you, you got a little bit of deity on the inside of you when you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You're not just a body. You're not just a human being. You're a God man. You're a God woman. You're a Christ man, a Christ woman, filled and united with him, filled with him, filled with his life the life of God, filled with his power, given his authority to manifest and demonstrate him on the earth. The last thing is this. Number five, we must be ever conscious of him. You know, you can know all the scriptures. You can know all the things to say and the things to do. You could be very mechanical with it. You could formalize it. You could do all of those things. But if you're not conscious of him, you're not going to get very far. The thing that's been missing in the message of faith for a very long time is the peace of fellowship. Faith is an automatic byproduct of our fellowship with God. We must be conscious of Him. We must be hearing from Him and seeing from Him so we know exactly what to do and what to say in a given situation for that very specific moment with that person. We must be able to do those things. Just like in the dream when I went after that guy and I'm standing in front of him in that moment the Lord speaks to me and says, sometimes people don't need sympathy. Sometimes they need a move of God. We must be conscious of him. So five things we must see so we can do. We must see ourselves as sent ones, see ourselves as a master of the curse, see that all things are possible, see ourselves as a spirit being. And then finally, we must ever be conscious of, of him so we can see from him and hear from him. Calling all the Elijahs, get ready, because Mount Carmel's and Jezebel's, they're about to start calling. We're going to see these types of things again. And the great thing is, you and I, not just going to be on the sidelines watching, you and I are going to be on the field demonstrating. Praise God. Aren't you excited what God has called you and I to do? To those of you that are partners with Chad Gonzalez Ministries, thank you so, so very much for your partnership and being a part of the dream team. If you're not a partner, you can simply go to chadgonzalez.com and become a part of the dream team today. We would love for you to be a part of the team. Hey, if you're not aware, we've got healing talks that takes place every Tuesday. You can go to YouTube and Facebook and join in live every single Tuesday night. We'd love for you to be a part of that as well. God bless you, friends. Remembering Christ, we always win. We'll talk to you next month. Bye-bye.